Good morning and welcome to our Easter Sunday service here in Rosemary Street. And also a good morning to those who are watching online. Today, Easter Sunday, we're glad to welcome Reverend Chris Hudson, our minister in charge, to the pulpit. Next Sunday, our worship will be led by Reverend Mike O'Sullivan, the minister of our church in Cork. So I hope as many people as possible will be able to come to that. Just a wee advance notice, the next committee meeting will be on Thursday the 20th of April at 7.30pm. And copies of the April Bulletin are still available in the vestibule. Now, after the service, I hope you can join us for tea or coffee. And I believe we have hot cross buns, although there will really be cold cross buns. I hope you can join us for those after the service. And just before I bring Chris forward, David Alderdes has one other announcement to make. There'll also be chocolate eggs as well. That, that's not the announcement. But <laughs> so there will be a special meeting of the congregation after the service on Sunday the 30th of April. So three weeks from today. The church committee met last week and wished to present a proposal to the church members. This proposal, in brief, is to appoint a part-time minister for transition for six months. A person to facilitate us as we think strategically on how we move forward into the future as a community. They would also preach some Sundays and support us pastorally during that period. Many of you saw and heard Brian Ammons a few weeks ago on a Zoom call held in the Minor Hall. I think most folk present were impressed with Brian. The ultimate decision, however, is for the church to make, and so I'd encourage you to be present on the 30th when we can flesh out more detail and answer any queries. So make an effort to be there if you can. Thank you.
Good morning. And uh, that was a wonderful and beautiful opening with an intro from the Ballon Scholars. May I also take the opportunity to thank all of those from First Church that joined us in All Souls on Good Friday. Uh, it was a wonderful occasion, a joint service from our two congregations, and it was so wonderful to have you all there. And I don't know if you noticed, but as well with our sister church in Dublin, the Dublin Unitarian Church, appeared on a lot of news programs over the last few days, on ITV 10 o'clock news, uh, or TA news, because every year in our Dublin church, they read out all the names from lost lives, a record of all those who died during the conflict here in Northern Ireland. So this in many ways is a very special weekend because it's also the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement or the Belfast Agreement. And may I also apologize that I will be disappearing near the end, not completely, or not magically, but I have a communion service in All Souls so near the end of this service, I have to quietly uh, take my absence. Let us pray. In you, Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, set me free. Into your hands, I commend my spirit if you will redeem me. <coughs> Almighty, ever-living, loving God, in whose hands lies every human heart and the rights of all peoples, look with favour, we pray, on those who govern us, on those who have authority over us, and those who govern throughout the world. Guide them with your wisdom. Help them build the prosperity of all peoples, the assurance of peace, and the freedom of all religions. May through your gift we be made secure. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. And now may we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And now may we sing together our first hymn. It's hymn number 160. Jesus Christ has risen today. Alleluia.
our first reading is from Jesus, A New Vision by Marcus Borg. And it's entitled Easter and the Birth of the Living Christ. Though the story of the historical Jesus ends with his death on a Friday in AD 30, the story of Jesus does not end there. According to his followers, death could not hold him, and he appeared to them in a new way beginning on Easter Sunday. Indeed, he has continued to be known by Christians ever since as a living reality. We cannot know exactly what happened. According to the earliest accounts of Easter reported by his followers, Jesus appeared to them. And they knew that it was the same person they'd known during the ministry. We do not know what form those appearances took. Sometimes the language used to describe them seems to speak of visionary experience. Sometimes Jesus is described in quite corporeal form. We can say that the resurrection is not the resuscitation of a corpse. That is, resuscitation and resurrection are quite different from each other. The former involves a once dead person coming back to life and resuming the conditions of ordinary existence until he or she dies again. Whatever the resurrection involved, it was clearly not that. Instead, resurrection means entry into another mode of being, not restoration to a previous mode of being. In Jesus' case, to use the language of the church, it meant being raised to God's right hand. Did Easter nevertheless involve something happening to the corpse of Jesus? On historical grounds we cannot say. What we can say, however, is that from the standpoint of Christian faith most crucial, Jesus' followers continued to experience him as a living reality and in a new way, namely as having the qualities of God. Now he could be known anywhere, and not just in a particular place. Now he was the presence which abided with them, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now he was seated at the right hand of God, participated in the power and authority of God. Now they knew him as both Lord and Christ. He who was put to death because of his passion to transform culture in the name of the Spirit was not swallowed up by either death or culture. Indeed, Spirit triumphed over culture. Amen.
Now it's time for the twins to go out, but before they do, I have a wonderful task, and that is to bring them over their Easter eggs. admit I'd be that excited as well if someone gave me an Easter egg. Uh, for the second reading I've selected Easter Day by Christina Rossetti. Words cannot utter Christ is returning. Mankind keep jubilee strip off your mourning Crown you with garlands, set your lamps burning. Speech is left speechless, set you to singing. Fling your hearts open wide, set your bells ringing. Christ, the chief reaper, comes his sheaf bringing. Earth wakes her songbirds, puts on her flowers, leads out her lambkins, builds up her bowers. This is man's spousal day, Christ's day and ours. The beautiful words of Christina Rossetti. I mentioned earlier on about the particular weekend that we are marking, as well as being the season of Easter, we're marking the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, or as some say the Good Friday Agreement, and others the Belfast Agreement, because although signed on Good Friday, in 98. The date was, in actual fact, the 10th of April. So, to be precise, it is the 10th of April, which is, and it is officially called the Belfast Agreement. So it's even interesting that the very agreement that we all signed together to bring us together, in actual fact, has two names, just like everything else in Northern Ireland, we have two names for no matter what we do. Easter being a movable holiday, do you often wonder why Easter is a movable feast? Well, Easter is a movable feast because the early believers in Christianity wanted to keep Easter related to the Jewish Passover. The death, burial and resurrection of Jesus happened after the Passover. And if you ever visit Israel, 
you can actually meet some, a small community, who are Jews for Jesus. Now they are not, they are not, I hastily add, they're not Christian, they are Jews who believe that Jesus was the Messiah and that he will come again, but that more than anything, he was a humble rabbi. The Jewish holiday calendar is based on solar and lunar cycles. Each feast is movable. The dates change every year. Beginning with the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, the Western Church wanted to establish a more standardised system to determine dates for Easter. Astronomers were able to approximate the dates of all the full moons in future years for the Western Christian churches. They could establish a table of ecclesiastical full moon dates in order to mark out the specific feast dates. These dates would determine the holy days on the ecclesiastical calendar. Now in 1583 this was slightly modified but the method was established for determining ecclesiastical or religious full moon dates so from then on you could determine what dates the holy seasons would fall on so in western christianity easter is always celebrated on the sunday immediately following the paschal fall moon, the Passover fall moon, one of the most significant days in the Jewish calendar. So Easter follows the Paschal, or Passover fall moon. But now this is determined by historical tables approximating the fall moons. Now, some people often say, why didn't the state just fix the spring holidays. It's surprising that in the secular age we live in that hasn't happened. It could still be in April and it would still suit many people and they wouldn't have to check their diary every year to see when Easter falls. So they'd know what days they were going to get off. And the churches could continue with their movable feasts. However, sticking to the ecclesiastical or religious full moon, those dates have stood and the state has decided to stay with that. But it's not the fixing of dates that concerns us at this time of year. What concerns us is how we believe and how that this story, the story of this week, of Easter week, how that fits into our understanding. And whatever way you understand the story as a Christian. Because I personally believe that many, many Christians have a different understanding of this particular weekend. I had to point out on Good Friday in All Souls Church, it was a halfway house between the Anglican and the Roman Catholic tradition. I had a cross that I got from Central America, which is used in outdoor masses by Franciscan priests, which depicts Jesus at the Last Supper with the disciples. And we had Bread, communion bread and we had goblets for serving the wine and people came up as in the Anglican or the Catholic tradition. Why did I do that? I think it's probably nostalgia because I was brought up a Catholic and there's certain things that live on with you and no matter how much you intellectualize or change, certain things that you learn as a child stay with you. Maybe there's a sense of romance about it. Maybe there's a sense of poetry about it. And yet, as a Unitarian, 
I have to think how do I accept the story of Easter. One member of your congregation said to me on Friday, I won't mention him or her by name, it's a metaphor. And I said, yeah, I'll work on that. For many, it is a literal story that Jesus died on the cross for our salvation. That Jesus actually died on the cross. We know historically he died on the cross, but he died, he chose to die, and to die for our salvation. For others, that can be extremely difficult to comprehend that a loving God would need a blood sacrifice that he would need his son to die in such a brutal fashion in order to be appeased. And I am one of those people that find that hard to grasp, that the God that I have a sense of is loving, is inclusive, is in compassionate. But then I understand there are many other factors or many other ways of seeing the story and seeing Jesus' death. And whatever way you're understanding, at least we could all agree that there is no need for any more blood sacrifices, even if we committed ourselves to that. And in this sacred or secular world, in order to help us to lead a more positive or inclusive life. Because surely that is the message, even from an orthodox point of view, that there is no need for anyone else to die allegedly for our sins, for our wrongdoings. Let us remember all those who today are being sacrificed throughout the world literally sacrifice, the many who live in prisons, enslaved, who are punished for some twisted idea of faith, for some obscure or crazy political ideology that's going to make the world perfect. Some of you met some of the young Iranians that attend all souls. All of them are here because they had to flee their homeland and they miss it dearly. They're here because they can no longer accept the theocracy that they're forced to live under in Iran and have come to live amongst us. We think of the people in the Ukraine and the suffering that they're going through at the hands of Putin and his desire to reclaim the Ukraine as part of his greater Russia. We think of the people in Israel and Palestine locked forever, it would appear, in some sort of combat. Neither trust in the, the other. Israelis fearful that those neighbours around them will destroy their Jewish homeland. And Palestinians continuously feeling that they're the underdog in where they would regard as their homeland. All these sacrifices are still happening, yet we as Christians believe they shouldn't be happen happening because Jesus was sacrificed for all our wrongdoings and all our sins. Whether we believe that literally or whether we believe that in a poetic way, that's the sense of the message. And here in Belfast, the great and the good will gather next week. The great and the good will gather in Belfast. They'll fly in in their big planes and they'll bring limousines and we'll have to be stopped at traffic lights in case we upset their journey. And the great and the good will come here to tell us about the noble contributions they made to our peace. And we should be very happy that they did that. Like it wasn't the people on the peace line, 
It wasn't the women working in communities silently and diligently at the awkward edges of where communities meet. Like the people on Good Friday who marched on, who walked on the Shankle and the Falls together, carrying a cross in recognition of that sacrifice. But however, the great and good are important because hopefully they'll go away and they might think and reflect. But when they leave, we must continue. Folk like us, the ordinary folk of this city, the ordinary folk of this province, when they disappear, we will have to continue. We will have to continue to build what we started many years ago. Building a peace with all its imperfections. Continue building it. In order to acknowledge the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Compassionate God. Please help us to learn to resolve our differences and our understanding of your love to work together in harmony. Compassionate and loving God, please help us to make our beautiful city of Belfast, our space shared with dignity, shared with respect. And we ask this, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now let us have a moment of silence. And now Billy will sing for us. Were you there when they crucified our Lord?
final hymn this morning is hymn 169, the day of resurrection, that's hymn 169. Descend upon us and remain with us forever. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.